I will now switch into English. Um, <laughs> yes, that Jenny understands me. I'm very happy um, that she's here today. That's Jenny Chan. And um, maybe you've already seen her yesterday or heard her yesterday at the panel. What's the weight of a bit? Um, she is. She has a PhD in sociology and China studies from the University of London, and is assistant professor for sociology and China studies at the Hong Kong Polytech University. And since 2010, she's been studying the working condition, conditions at Foxconn, one of the world's largest contact, contract electronics manufacturer. And one of the results of her work is a co-authored book, which has the same title as her talk today, Dying for an iPhone. And I already talked to Jenny a little bit um, before this uh, started, and um, there's already a Italian and Spanish translation of the book published. She will maybe tell us a little bit um, what's the problem of the English translation of her book. There's also a Chinese version which came out under very difficult conditions. And we are waiting and looking for a translator for a German version. So if you're willing to translate a book into German, please talk to Jenny afterwards. Yeah, now I'm really happy that she's here and brings in uh, in my opinion, very important topic to this conference. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, good morning. Thank you so much. I, it's my great honor to be in Berlin. I fly from Hong Kong and only to join this two days conference. Tomorrow I will be leaving, going back to Hong Kong and teach on Wednesday morning. So thank you so much for coming and uh, I am most grateful for all the organizers. Uh, this is really a great opportunity for us to talk more about the changing political situation in China and have a focus on labor rights issue. Uh, my talk is dying for an iPhone. Dying for an iPhone, there are two meanings, double meanings. One, we really refers to the workers who have been assembling iPhones and other electronics devices for us and they have been doing lots of over overtime and under some desperate conditions, some of the young workers kill themselves. The other meaning is for us consumers. <laughs> we have been looking forward for a new model of iPhones. We cannot wait for another upgrade of our iPad. We keep tracing after all these new models and uh, we are kind of also crazy for it. We, we queue up for the latest models and want to get it at the good price and with all the technological advancement. You know, I think that this is really an advancement that nowadays we have the computer inside our pocket. <laughs> These are the huge imagination and really great technological advancement when we had not imagined that we will have a camera as on a phone and then also a computer inside our pocket. But this all becomes uh, three in one. We have the phone, we have the computer, <laughs> and we have the camera or other electronics uh, device in just one uh, product, and that is iPhone or smartphone. Uh, so this talk is really about production and consumption. There are two sides of the same coins, uh, and I do want to inspire some more thoughts and imaginations about how the conditions in China or in other developing countries, but they can be improved because of our participation, our concern uh, in some actions. Okay, let's start. Uh, dying for an iPhone, back in 2010, there were 18 suicides. That doesn't really happen in Apple's own factories. Apple no longer produces its iPhones within its own compressors. There is only one uh, Mac pr production base in Ireland, uh, in, in Cork in Ireland. But those suicides are take place in China. In 2010, 18 worker suicides at Foxconn in China, they killed themselves, resulting 14 deaths. Only four survived, 
but they have crippling injuries. So what are Foxconn? I don't think many of us know what is Foxconn uh, before 2010, because like you, I'm more familiar with Apple, Sony, or Samsung, but I almost never heard about Foxconn. And I still remember when some journalists call me, they say, oh, Fox, Foxconn or Dot com. So that is more familiar with them, some other technological companies, but not Foxconn. But, but I want to assure you why this is so important and that deserved me some more years until now to work on that. Foxconn at that time have more than one million workers and most of them actually were based in China. Foxconn is a Taiwanese multinational, but they really have their huge, biggest production site in China. They are not only providing the device for Apple, but all other big names that we know. Um, Foxconn's workforce with about one million, that is more or less equivalent to the population of Estonia, another European country. So one million, that is super huge. And in this factory, we have seen some very tragic uh, incidents. There is a worker who wrote a short blog post that was removed only three, three days after it appeared on online, but we were able to just save it in time. And I translate it here. Perhaps for the Foxconn employees and employees like us, the use of death is simply to testify that we will ever alive at all, and that while we lived, we had only despair. It is a sense of anxiety and deep depression here. When they are alive, they felt so desperate and hopeless, so much so that they prefer to just jump from the building and end their lives. For Foxconn, they didn't ask what are the causes underlying what had drive, drive them, drove them to kill their lives, but they only set up the so-called safety lads everywhere. They set up the, the anti-suicide lads between the dormitories, uh, outside the buildings, try to catch the jumpers. But will this safety device help at all to save lives? I talked to one of the survivors, at that time, she was only 17 years old. She was born in 1993. Her name is Tian Yu. So very typical to other one million workers in China. She is from the countryside, one of the rural migrant workers. And after 12 days, when she regained consciousness, I am able to talk to her. And find out that she had been working in one business group in Foxconn. Well, there are 12 business groups who have been competing against each other for the lowest possible price for the maximum productivity they can have. And one of that business groups is called IDPBG, Integrated Digital Product Business Group. This group, they are only servicing Apple. So on this assembly line, they only assemble iPhone, and at that time, the original version of iPad. So we talked to her and came to understand that her story is not that unique. There are some common uh, features among these young generation of Chinese rural migrants. Within China, since the 1970s, after Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao's death, then we have the openness. We opened the economy for foreign investment. There were new factories like Foxconn, other Taiwanese firms. They set up their production base. And this really uh, came to be a big wave of rural to urban migration. So these migrants, they also hope for better lives like you and I. They graduate, want to get better jobs to support their parents. In China, there are totally nearly 300 million of these migrants within China. And for them, the dream had been working in Foxconn. Well, Foxconn, air-conditioned, uh, high-tech company that had been their dream, and it turns out that the reality is something different. So Foxconn had become the world's largest electronics supplier. The founder and CEO is Terry Gold. 
The founding year was 1974. Um, some of us were not even born uh, at, in 1974, me either. Well, so at that time already, Foxconn took advantage of the openness of the market, and very soon, uh, Terry Grove set up the first factory just north of Hong Kong in Shenzhen, in southern part of China. And the business had been growing. Most of the orders were from Apple. But as you can see, all these company logos, Foxconn also uh, get contracts and become the suppliers, key suppliers, to Intel, to Sony, to IBM, so many different clients uh, in their production base. So Foxconn had become the world's largest electronics supplier so much so that more than half of the global market is actually occupied by Foxconn. What does it mean? Per every two electronics items, more than one is assembled by Foxconn. So perhaps our smartphones, our tablet, uh, is also assembled by Foxconn. So Foxconn is a global company, an industrial empire. You can see from this global map, there have been factories in Brazil, um, also some uh, in Europe, right? Uh, Czech Republic is actually their largest uh, European regional headquarter. But as you can see the big dots, the largest factories are within China. In just one compound, they could have m uh, m nearly half of a million uh, workforce. Well, here you can see nearly 400,000, but according to our figures, at one point of time, they have more than 500,000 in just one uh, factory zone. So it is a compound where you got canteen, warehouse, kindergarten, university, everything in just one compound. It's amazing, it's huge, and I got the staff card and I became an undercover researcher when I did my PhD dissertation. So I went to one of the uh, factories in Shenzhen, another factory in Chengdu, uh, that is in the interior part of China. So I did lots of uh, information collection. And here, it is another kind of uh, statistics that I want to show you the scale, the size of Foxconn. That is truly incredible. If you look at these bars, there are two di different types of bars. Uh, we can look at the revenue first. Apple, Samsung, Amazon, and Foxconn. Per year, they got almost the highest uh, revenues. They are the top tech company around the world. And if we look at the black uh, solid bar, that comes to the net sales, profits. So yes, Apple is the most profitable firm, but Foxconn is also not doing that bad, right? <laughs> In terms of profits, it's even more than Sony, uh, Hitachi, Amazon, and some other companies. So in this um, global production, we are talking the biggest brands like Apple and also the largest supplier like Foxconn in the very complicated global production chain. But these are the dominant players which set the terms and dictate more or less the labor conditions on the ground. Having given you a very quick overview about Foxconn, let me move on to Apple. Because Apple is truly the biggest successful company. You and me are more or less also the fan of Apple. I also use some products of Apple that make me even facing more dynamic and, and controversial uh, kind of uh, sense of uh, existence. Uh, but anyway, let me continue to talk about Apple first. Um, 
The, one of the co-founders, Steve Jobs, unfortunately, he passed away because of pancreas cancer in 2011. But you can see that from 2010, we got the suicide scandal, and we have been writing to Steve Jobs about what's going on in China. Can you please respond and fix the problems? Because you are also part of the problem. If not Apple, which had been chasing after all these products to be launched into the market, the pressure onto the shop floor will not be that great. So we have been communicating with Apple, and Apple, uh, their answers or their measures, I will hold it and talk to you later. First of all, let us understand the division of labor. <laughs> Since the 1960s and 70s, Apple then only focused on branding, market, design, and these low-value-add manufacturing jobs, they were all outsourced to Taiwan, and then China, and Southeast Asians. So Apple only retained one Mac uh, production base in Ireland. I just mentioned it. And then um, later on, Apple wants to show us that they have a global production base. And China is just one of the base uh, in the long supplier list. However, Foxconn is still the largest supplier of Apple, even though Apple has more than 2,000 big and small suppliers in China alone. So these information are based on our conversation with the Apple University faculty member. So we do have to chat how is the business is going on, uh, what are the uh, significance when we look into the Apple and Foxconn supply chain. Here is another pie chart that we want to show you. When Apple's iPhone was uh, assembled by Foxconn only, Foxconn had been the exclusive supplier of iPhone back in 2010, how much actually Chinese workers could get. It is the tiny slice here but the lion's share goes to Apple. Apple got nearly 60% of the gross profit. That means if an iPhone is selling $100, Apple will got 58.5, and then raw material is only about one-fifth of the 100 US dollars. Suppliers' gross profit uh, it can refer to LG or Samsung, some other higher value add components. And the Chinese workers who have been assembling iPhones, that is even less than 2% that will go into their income. You see, this is a highly unequal supply chain we are looking into. And let me go back to one slide, just want to show you this is the huge global map of the Apple suppliers. You can see that 349 largest suppliers, they are based in China. There are also some suppliers of Apple that are based in Germany. But in terms of the scale, it's far much less uh, than that in China. OK, so Foxconn was the only supplier back in 2010. Later, Apple tried to spread the risk, the business risk, and then they split the iPhone order with Packatron and other company. This is just another illustration to show you, again, how uneven the distribution of value. Workers, again, just get a tiny portion of the iPhone 6. We got upgrading almost on a year on average, but still the division of profit and the income of workers doesn't change a lot. It is still the tiny, the small bit that will go to workers, but the huge amount that would be retained by Apple, while Apple produces nothing. I mean, in terms of engineering, design, yes, but not manufacturing at all. Um, given all this background, we decided that we need our first-hand primary data, and me and some other classmates at that time in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China. We joined a huge research group that is from Greater China, including mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. 
what we have done, uh, we talk to the workers on site, we do interviews with them, we do some video taking, also ask some managers about the production, the labor process. And then I also talked to trade unions and some government officials. That became my dissertation that I finished in 2014. And it takes some even longer time uh, for me to write up the book with two other professors. What we have found on the software, there are other slogans that say you have to push yourself really to the limit, otherwise you will be punished or you will be fired. These are the slogans, value efficiency every minute, every second. Execution is the integration of speed, accuracy, and precision. Achieve goals or the sun will no longer rise. There's no best way, but always a better way. The devil is in the details. All these are super high level pressure that all these young girls and boys, they are enduring every day. And despite all the hard work, they are earning the minimum wage. Back in then, Foxconn are paying, but even though they are the largest electronics manufacturer in the whole world, they are paying the legal minimum. And then because of the media attention, the scandal, they raise a little bit the minimum wage from the June 1st in 2010. And at that time, it was already 12 uh, suicides were record in just the first five months. They raise a little bit, and then the nanos around the industrial sites, um, they also raise the rent, just as expensive as Berlin. <laughs> so it's like giving on the one hand, but also taking away on the other hand. Some are by the landlord, but the others are also by Foxconn itself, because Foxconn begins to charge them for the canteen food, and also charge a little bit higher for the dormitory rent. Um, after all, not only the wages had not been significantly improved over the years, but they also have to do lots of overtime. And these overtime are compulsory. It is not voluntary. So within one week, there could be more than 80 hours that are working online on the assembly line. And then when you go back to the dormitory, what you want to do is just to sleep so that you have energy to work the other day. And seven days a week or 14 days in two weeks time, only one day of rest, it becomes the routine whenever the new product are launched. So over time, again, it is not based on consensus, it is based on coercion. And restriction of them to resign because you have to hold the uh, uh, labor force here to engage in production. So during the peak production month, these workers have to do forced overtime. They are just like forced labor. That is not voluntary. And when I just live with them in the dormitory, well, no longer possible nowadays. At that time, I could still pretend that I'm one of the working girls. Well, I'm older than them on average. They're only 16, 18, or in their early 20s. But I could just pretend myself as one of them and borrow the staff car. But since then, security had been also tight and I think I would not be able to just sneak into the dormitory and do all this kind of research. But dormitory is a really important setting. It is an extension of production control. You can maximize the work time by asking them to do more overtime, and then you just get them back to the dormitory, they sleep, and then they get back to work. So dormitory should not be taken as a kind of welfare, but it is an extension of the production regime. It is a social, spatial control, the space. And then we decide to do the video. This video could be uploaded onto YouTube. And the title is The Truth of the Apple iPad, because then I already moved from the southern part of China to the southwestern part of China, and that is Chengdu. Chengdu is the provincial capital of Sichuan, and the Chengdu Foxconn factory only produced one product for one firm, and that is producing iPad for Apple only. At that time, it was the upgradation from the original iPad 
that was launched in 2010. And when while I was there after the Chinese New Year, when it was still so cold, uh, they are upgrading to iPad 2. So I witnessed how the explosion happened in May 2011, and that killed another four workers and injured a dozen. So my group, I belong to a, a student group called SACOM. Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior, we do all these uh, campaigns in Hong Kong, well, not in China, but in Hong Kong. We show how Apple had been focusing only on production speed and at the sacrifice of work safety and health. Because we already finished our rough cut, we even sent the video to Apple, but Apple just didn't reply, really didn't reply to us at all, but we then talked to the Guardian on the International Day. It was the 1st of May 2011, and seven days later, Foxconn did reply to the journalists and say the conditions are perfect. But then two weeks later, the explosion happened. Do you know why the explosion happened? Because when the workers have to run the corners of the iPad, it is so smooth, you run the corner, it is not done by machine, but done by human hands. When the aluminum dust saturates in the hall, in their production software, someone turned on the light and it triggered the fire and the explosion. And therefore, uh, it happened, and the uh, unnecessary loss of lives. So all this work, Accidents, the forced overtime, low wages, all these are the big issue. But now, let me just take it really quick to talk about the interns. I want you to know that they are not just the migrant, the rural migrants, but some are young students. They have been taken from the vocational schools all over China to work on the assembly line to produce for you and me, our iPhone, our iPad, 12 hours a day for three months for as long as one year, just like working on the assembly line as a robot. And these young student interns, they cannot graduate if they do not fulfill the so-called internship in Foxconn. So that is quite horrible here. We have the collusion between the vocational schools, Foxconn, and the local government. So who are these student interns? They are about 16, 17, or 18 years old, just a little bit higher than the uh, minimum working age. They are doing the three-year vocational school courses. The first two years supposed to be listening to lecture, like what we are doing now uh, inside the classroom, but the final year should be working on uh, in a workplace that is matching their majors of studies. But it turns out to be completely not the case. Some of them are just in their first year, but were already sent to Foxconn to do the massive production because Foxconn is running out of factory hands and taking hundreds or thousands of students from the vocational schools that is the best solution, the quickest and the lowest possible. Given the fact that China has been expanding in terms of vocational education, by 2020, we are anticipating 23.5 million of students who are within this age, they had already completed their middle school or the junior secondary school, they will be enrolling into the vocational school for three years. This group of population, we are talking potentially, that is more than 23 million. And so you can see potentially Foxconn can get tens of thousands or millions of students from these vocational schools. This is a mockery, uh, a cartoon, a comic that we see in the newspaper, and that these students, they do not have their eyes to see because they have to follow blindly to intern in Foxconn. They do not have the mouth to speak. They cannot complain. They can only have years to listen. Otherwise, you cannot graduate. So interns are not uh, the one who really do some skills training or internship that are relevant to their studies, but that is unrelated. And they are not legally recognized as employees. They are interns. That means that they do not have the rights for any social insurance. And I think even to my sock is the fact that nowadays, this is not only vocational schools which send their students to Foxconn, and the teachers are having double pay. 
One pay from their school, another pay from Foxconn. So the teachers are kind of involving in the internship. And I just want to tell you that it is not just about teachers, but nowadays the labor agencies the pro for private, private agencies, they are also sending the students to Foxconn and other companies to make a cut in the deal. So this is the labor trade that we have been discovering and I published one journal article called Interneighbor in China last year that exactly want to expose all these collusion uh, student interns, which has not just happened in Foxconn, but in an, another supplier factory. And last uh, month, we got the publicity in the Financial Times, another supplier, Quanta. All these different suppliers, they record the problems of the abuses of student interns. So now I'm trying to wrap up to the final section because um, after me, there will be also another speaker, so I will have maximum another 10 minutes, but I will try to finish uh, as quick as possible so that we can have some interactions. I want to then take a note here. No matter how rosy our future, we have been talking about robotic revolution, the use of technology. Yes, to some extent, the use of robots or robotic arms that can replace some very routine, boring, repetitive jobs, dangerous work, but also, how about these workers? They are also losing jobs because if without skills training, these workers, they are at the risk of being redundant and just laid off. Um, there are some tensions between technology and labor and that have been vividly described in Capital in uh, the volume one by Karl Marx. But now in the 21st century, we are going back to the same old question. Um, for me, if I just stop here, it is a very depressive talk. We are just ending into nowhere, given all this suppression, the bio-driven model. But I want to tell you, we cannot accept all these injustice. And we have been organizing campaign behind our iPhone. We got eye slaves in Foxconn. And that we have been holding the banner within the Apple store in Hong Kong. We take use of the time and media attention to show that slavery should put an end now. And that last year, I also joined this campaign when the iPhone 10 was launched in the market. Um, the abuses in Foxconn have been also going on for 10 years now. So are there any changes? Uh, what are the possibilities for us to create some change? We have been writing the books, and this is the Spanish version, the Italian version, the Chinese version. But unfortunately, the 3,000 copies that we want to publish in China, they were all destroyed uh, by the Beijing government in the last minute um, because of censorship issue. And that the English one, we are still struggling because some book publishers are really concerned about the lawsuits that might be fired from Apple or from Foxconn. So we have lots of difficulties to get the book published with my two co-authors. They are also my mentors, Professor Mark Sheldon and Professor Punai. But anyway, we will keep doing all our best. And now we do have some more clear direction on how to go, what, what to go forward in terms of sustainability or sustainable development. One, companies, including the buyers and suppliers, we do need an industry-wide solution. It is not just about Apple or Foxconn, but every company have to get involved to fix the problems within their production chain that is involving labor and environmental responsibility. Secondly, of course, our government, our Chinese government, which respect workers' rights and protect the student interns. Workers themselves, they have to stand up and fight for trade union rights and civil society, like you and me, journalists, students. We can all pay more attention on the situation within China and other production countries. I know everyone loves uh, iPad and iPhones so much, and this is uh, the picture I took when I traveled to Beijing earlier this year. 
But at the same time, we can also call consumers to pay attention, not necessarily boycott, but put pressure onto the brands. Uh, in Germany, I'm so grateful for all of you. Some German groups joined the campaign, strike different. And in China, despite the fact that go on strike is not really protected, but there have been strikes and protests that have been going on. CLB, they produced this map to show you workers have been trying all their best to demand for economic rights as well as democratic elections of their union, despite the fact that the union only belonged to China uh, underneath the party state that is subordinate to government control. But nowadays, we are talking about 2.8 million unions at the enterprise level, involving more than 300 million union members. If they can really exercise democratic elections, that would make some change. Nowadays, the students are supporting workers who are fighting for unionization in another factory called JSEC. But these students are being arrested. And I really try to call here, let us support them, because they are all young people who are doing no wrong, but just to support JSEC workers who are fighting for democratic union and they register under the trade union law. I know Berlin people, uh, thank you so much, you have been supporting uh, to fight for releasing the students and releasing the NGO workers. Uh, this is one of the NGO staff who have been arrested. No one knows where are they, and now it's more than 20 students as well as workers who are detained. Um, we don't know where are they, but we have been uh, pro pro promoting some different kind of campaigns and want them to be released unconditionally. And I thank you so much for your attention. If we have some comments and discussions, you're most welcome. This is actually a very dangerous moment. Um, but we have been writing commentary to different newspapers and we have been organizing another petition now to release all the students, supporters, as well as workers from JSEC because they have been following the law. It is just the Chinese government see them as a coalition between the students and the workers that seems to get some, you can say the spectre comes again when we think about June 4th in 1989 or when we think even all the times in 1919 when we have the May 4th movement, the intellectuals and the students join forces uh, to fight for progressive social change. So this is also another time that we have this kind of crackdown on the NGOs as well as the student groups and we do need some solidarity support. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Jenny, for your very important and brave work and for presenting it here. I think it's, yeah, it's an aspect which is really often forgotten in all that digitalization hype. And um, yeah, also thank you for pointing to the value chain, which I think that many people have on their back screen, like in connection to coffee and clothes, but it's often forgotten, like when we use our iPhones or laptops or iPads. Um, now we have a little bit time for questions because um, yeah, our third slot, um, which was planned to be a talk by Peter Geilhofer. Peter Geilhofer is ill, so we are doing this one a little bit longer. And if you have questions, you can all just raise your hand really high and I will come to you. Or you go to the microphones here. They are turned on. Okay. Thanks for your nice and vivid talk. Thanks. And can you tell us a little bit more about your book, especially what's the uh, original language? Thank you so much. Uh, the book. Okay, I will be going back to the book very soon now. Hi, the book. <laughs> um, I have been writing in English, and the earlier versions have been translated into Spanish, Italian, and traditional Chinese. That is the characters we use in Hong Kong. 
but the simplified Chinese version cannot be published in China. Not only about Apple as one of the huge investors in China, they also set up their R&D research, uh, uh, research and development centers in different parts of China. And Apple is also willing to <laughs> Also willing to just remove the VPN apps from their store and to kind of uh, follow some advice from the government in terms of internet security or internet um, censorship. So you can see not only about the company's intrinsic interests, the state and the company, but it is also the fact that there is one chapter we talk about interns and all this collusion or corruption on the ground. And I do believe that it is these chapters that really touch on the nerves of the Chinese government. Uh, yeah, but so sooner or later, we will, we will make it happen. We will push ahead the English version and the German version, I also look forward that we might have the translation, but first of all, let us try to really get the possibility to get it out. It has been on and off for some years. It has been also quite some pressure on me. Um, as I have finished my PhD in 2014, and now some years on, we have been up updating it, we have been enriching the content, uh, but still, for many different reasons, the English one cannot yet get it done. Uh, and the simplified Chinese version, that is the simplified Chinese characters, could be read uh, in China, but the Chinese government destroy it. We have the publisher. I don't name that academic publisher now, but it was really in the last minute, the 3,000 copies, they were all destroyed, and we are banned from publication. I mean, freedom of press, freedom of information, freedom of speech, something we can't take for granted, um, but also not much so nowadays in Hong Kong because of the shrinking political space. Um, but I, I promise we will do all our best to ensure the accuracy. We will not compromise. We will, we will publish it. Hmm. Are there more questions? Yeah, if not, I would say thank you very much, Jenny, again for your uh, yeah, talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will enjoy another talk now with you. <laughs> <laughs>